Hello, and a very, very warm welcome to today's iCentuD Connect. Uh, sorry, we've started a little bit late. I think we all wanted to be fashionably late, and I hope it's given everyone a chance uh, to settle down and join us uh, for today's event and uh, this wonderful webinar that we've been really looking forward to. Um, it's the last in the year of our collaboration with the Global Schistosomiasis Alliance. And uh, throughout the year, we've had some really interesting and thought-provoking uh, insights into all the varied and numerous facets of schistosomiasis control. And again, just this week at WHO, we heard how um, MDAs and the huge amount of effort uh, to tackle this disease has led to a very encouraging and promising 60% reduction in cases among school children over the last two decades. So uh, um, a really encouraging momentum. But as we all know, um, pockets of persistent schistosomiasis remained. Um, the challenges are there and the road ahead um, is still full of gaps to be um, overcome, uh, whether it be in terms of data collection, behavior change, uh, vector control, lots of gaps remaining. And so to conclude this year, and as we come to the end of 2021, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome today's speakers who will be really talking to us about a hugely exciting approach to schistosomiasis control. Uh, we've got a wonderful panel of speakers joining us today, and we're really excited to be hearing all about how citizen science can really boost now the control of schistosomiasis, filling all those gaps I just mentioned, and also really aligning with what the WHO's roadmap on NTD control has been reminding us about, um, which is in terms of the three shifts, moving the programs to a results-driven approach uh, rather than processes, also really involving local communities, endemic regions, shifting the ownership there. And of course, the all important cross-sector partnerships, including with the public and with the communities themselves. So lots to talk about and to think about today with uh, some really exciting solutions. And uh, to introduce us to all these issues today, it's my pleasure to welcome, uh, first and foremost, Dr. Tina Husse. Tina, hello and welcome. Thank you, Marianne. You're from the Royal Museum for Central Africa in Belgium, and you, you're going to tell us a lot more about your work in this field and the ATRAP project, the Action Towards Reducing Aquatic Snail-Borne Parasitic Diseases, and we look forward to that. Uh, we're also delighted to welcome Mercy Gloria Ashefet. Mercy, welcome. Thank you so much, Marianne. You're also affiliated with the Royal Museum for Central Africa um, in Belgium, as well as, I believe, completing your uh, PhD at the King's University in Leuven. So a very warm welcome to you. And also joining us um, today, we have a double act, as you can see. It's our pleasure to welcome Julius to Masime. Julius, you're with the Marara University of Science and Technology in Uganda. Hi, Julius. Hi, hi Marian. Thank you. And joining us, sitting on your right, a very, very warm welcome to Bahungirehe Kruzestam. And Kruzestam, you are citizen scientist. You're the most important person in the room at this point. <laughs> so, a very warm welcome to everyone. We're joined as usual by um, a wonderful uh, group of colleagues and attendees. Lots of people have been saying hi on the chat. So a very warm welcome as well to Bonnie Webster from the Natural History Museum in London. Lizette van Lieshoot, a very warm welcome to you're tuning in from Leiden and Anu Guvras from the GSA, Global Schistosomiasis Alliance, uh, who will also be no doubt sharing lots of really useful resources with us um, throughout the webinar. So enough from me, very warm welcome to everyone. And first and foremost, I'm gonna hand over to you, Tina, to give us a bit more in background and information into what, what this is all about and how you've been able to involve citizens and communities so directly in your schistosomiasis control programs. 
Thank you very much for this nice introduction. I will start my presentation now. I hope it works. Okay, great. So uh, we will be talking about uh, Bilharzia, also known as snail fever uh, or schistosomiasis because this disease is transmitted um, by snails and it affects over 200 million people worldwide. Uh, symptoms include liver and bladder fibrosis, anemia, stunted growth, impaired cognitive development in children, um, infertility, and others. But it also leads to stigma and discrimination and social um, exclusion. Now, there is a very um, effective and safe drug available named Prozicuantel, and it has been central to control programs since 2002 in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but despite uh, very good uh, results obtained, as mentioned before, um, there are still countries where they uh, applied mass drug administrations, but where the disease um, remains endemic. These countries are here highlighted in red. Um, and so the estimates by some studies um, say that the global prevalence is still as high as it was uh, 50 years ago. So why is this? Well, um, schistomyces is a wicked problem because of the many uh, interacting factors that are linked with the environment. Think of the snails, rainfall, vegetation, but also human factors, mobility, behavior, and factors linked to the parasites. So all um, this complexity um, really defies conventional control strategies and policy design. Um, that's why the WHO recommended to um, a part of uh, a side of drug treatment to also um, focus on snail control and community involvement uh, if possible. But um, there are some challenges to snail control because there's a lack of um, snail experts and this leads to a lack of snail data to guide targeted control. And um, interventions are typically implemented top down, um, usually um, reactive to outbreaks without including the communities. And this has been shown to produce only short lived results. So um, that is why um, we turn to citizen science as a wicked solution, um, because by involving citizens, we can boost data collection, increase ownership, and this stimulates bottom-up approaches, um, which are thought to have um, long-term impacts. So um, to start off with a definition, um, citizen science can be defined as scientific activities in which non-professional scientists voluntarily participate in data collection, data analysis, and or dissemination um, of a scientific project. And you see on this figure, uh, this huge rise in citizen science projects in the last uh, decades. So you see in this square that about 78% of all the publications on citizen science um, originated in the period between 2006 and 2017. And why do we witness this uh, huge increase? For one thing, the technological, technological developments. So now with our smartphone, we are able uh, to collect data, to make measurements, and thanks to applications like iNaturalist, we can upload it to a central server and share it to the huge um, community um, worldwide. But at the same time, there is an increasing societal demand for science to become democratic, inclusive and open. There's many examples of successful citizen science projects, but for the sake of this presentation, I only highlight this one, which is named Mosquito Alert. It originated in Spain in order to track the invasion of the exotic tiger um, mosquito. So with um, this app, people all over the world can um, track tiger mosquito. They can take a picture. This picture um, will then be validated by experts, but they can also uh, report bitings or breeding sites and so on. And what you see here on the figure um, on the left in, in blue, 
Um, you see the locations of the traditional uh, surveillance um, stations with OV traps. And on the right, in yellow, you see all the um, uh, recordings that have been done by citizen scientists using this app. So you immediately see this increased coverage and you see that even uh, across outside Spain, they're uh, receiving um, sightings from citizens uh, all over the world. So this led the authors to state that the results suggest the potential for citizen science to outperform traditional methods in many uh, respects. And this is linked to the low cost, the scalability of the approach, but also the potential for real time analysis. But um, if we look at the number of citizen science publications per country based on first author affiliation, we see that the majority of projects are located in the north of America, in Europe, in Australia, and very few in Africa. And of course, um, as we all know, um, this is where we have a huge concentration of vector-borne diseases. So this really highlights the potential of citizen science in vector control. And this gave rise to um, our project, a trap um, action towards reducing aquatic parasitic um, organism. Um, it is um, ending in 2023 and it's coordinated by the Rome Museum for Central Africa and uh, in collaboration with Mambarara University of Science and Technology in Uganda, the Université de Kinshasa and INRB in uh, Congo, and with other uh, colleagues from the University of Antwerp, University of Leuven and the ITM. Um, we, want, uh, we, we have this integrated approach uh, where we train six PG students and seven master students in fields like biology, geography, sociology, anthropology, and epidemiology. But of course, uh, central to this project is this network of uh, citizen scientists that are trained both in Uganda and in Congo. And the citizens will help to monitor the snail distribution in order to create risk maps uh, for targeted snail control. But at the same time, they will be involved in community outreach, um, in awareness raising and behavioral uh, change, to induce behavioral change. So how do we do that? So the citizen um, scientists are, are equipped with um, these snail scoops, with a thermometer, uh, with a smartphone and protective gear. And then they will go out to the field weekly to a specific set of sites for snail collection. The snails are sorted and counted. Um, so water chemistry parameters are recorded. Um, pictures are taken uh, from the snails and upload it on the Kobo toolbox. Now, these data will be stored on a central server that can be accessed by um, RPG students, Julius and uh, Noelia, um, to validate the data. Now, Julius will talk about um, this part more in the next um, presentation. Now, these exact same sites are visited every month by our students for um, snail sampling in the same way, so 30 minutes per site. And they will also record um, uh, more biotic and abiotic factors. Back in the lab, the snails are tested for snail shedding and, um, and a diagnostic PCR is applied in order to identify the number of infected snails. And this information in turn is used to construct snail distribution maps and infection risk maps. And this data, together with the data from the citizen scientists and the biotic and abiotic factors, uh, will be used by Noelia for advanced spatial temporal modeling and forecasting. Now, the citizen scientists are also involved as communicators. And for this part, they are um, connected with our students from the social sciences and anthropology. Um, these students have, before, have performed focus group discussions, interviews, 
um, lived experiences to assess knowledge, attitudes, and practices of shisosomiasis in order to construct contextualized educational tools. Now, what came out of this, for example, for um, the, the south of Lake Albert in Uganda, uh, we found out there is a very high knowledge on the disease, but only 30% avoid water contact as a preventive measure. And why is this? Um, one of the reasons is that they say that the lake is only a main source of water or they lack latrines. Uh, but there's also some strong beliefs, for example, that they believe that defecating in the lake helps them to get a lot of fish. And we also see there is still um, stigma. People run away from you when you have bilharzia. Now, all this information has been uh, communicated to the citizen scientists and the uh, communities in the different districts around the lake in order to co-design contextualized communication tools to debunk these myths and induce behavioral um, change. So um, these tools, these flyers, these posters have been used by the citizen scientists for door-to-door -door visits. And together with the community um, and the citizen scientists, several awareness campaigns were developed, including theater, songs, uh, radio shows, but also these uh, signboards um, to discourage open defecation. Finally, uh, we also created a network with stakeholders, including local NGOs, NGOs, uh, political leaders, and in order to create this um, this dialogue among the um, involved people, and we also created an encounter between the citizen scientists and the policymakers, so that the citizen scientists could report on their findings, on their experiences. They sat down in breakout sessions to um, discuss um, recommendations and so on. So to conclude, as we have seen, Bilharza is a wicked problem, necessitating an integrative approach, um, which includes MDA, snail control, wash, and community involvement. And we think that citizen science has the potential to support and even combine some of these interventions by increasing uh, monitoring capacity and increasing public engagement at the same time. We also find out that the citizen scientists are trusted by the community so they can act as a bridge between the scientists and the uh, communities which allows for two-way uh, exchange, for example, of preventive measures to the community, but also of the community needs to the scientists and the policy makers. Um, we have also seen that stakeholders and uh, policy makers um, showed interest in the citizen science concept and the CAP surveys and the focus group discussions allow to co-develop contextualized educational tools and community communication strategies. And we hope that these citizen science-led awareness games, uh, campaigns will facilitate a shared problem serve, uh, solving and produce uh, long-lived results. Because the idea is to let communities own um, their problem. Of course, this remains to be seen. So next year, we will evaluate the whole citizen science intervention. Um, and our data set is continuously growing. We're still um, collecting data until the end of next year. But we think that this data that set is unprecedented in terms of spatial temporal resolution, which will really advance our understanding of snail population dynamics and uh, species distribution modeling. Um, now, through a comparison, um, I mean, a thorough comparison of these data collected by the citizens and by the experts um, is needed. And this will be um, discussed by Julius in his next presentation. Um, and then it's also very important to identify the intrinsic and extrinsic motivation of the citizen scientist because participant motivation is really key to the success of any citizen science project. And this will be discussed by Mercy Gloria Ashepet in the third presentation. 
So that allows me to thank um, the Belgian Development Corporation, um, but also all the partners involved in this study, uh, which you can see on the picture, um, most of them, uh, the different institutes that are involved. But of course, a big thank you uh, to all of the citizen scientists. So here is where I will end. Wow, thank you so much, Tina. I think the audience uh, will join me in being astounded at what you have told us about citizen science, uh, the growing force that this represents and to see it, um, you know, it's very exciting to see it applied to a subject that is very close to our hearts, all of us, which is a neglected tropical disease. So um, fantastic, thank you. and or embedding all uh, the data and the digital approaches. And this is really a, something very forward looking and that we uh, would love to hear a lot more about. You've introduced uh, Julia's talk and of course, citizen science, your approach sounds amazing, but and see how um, robust this is and where maybe are some of the remaining gaps that you'd like to see tackled. Uh, in the meantime, we've had a few more participants joining us. Uh, so a very quick hello to Rosalie from Sao Paulo in Brazil. Semu, hi again, joining in from Sokoto. Uh, and Maxon Anolito from the ATRAP project. So welcome, Maxon. I'm, I see a smile, Tina. <laughs> sure you know each other very well. Um, so on that note, I'll hand over to Julius now for your presentation. And uh, thank you very much. We're looking forward to hearing more. Oh, hello everyone. Once again, I hope I can be heard. I had a poor connection a little bit. And unfortunately, I have to load my presentation. Can I be heard, please? Let me know. If... Oh, that's okay. I think I can do that, Julius. Okay. There we go. Yeah, good. And we can hear you very well. So, touch wood. That's great. The connection will stay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, as Tina has already described very well, uh, and thank you for giving a good background. I will be presenting on uh, whether citizens can become malacologists, and this I'll be looking at the comparison of snail data in the Lake Albert region, which has been described already. So I am a PhD student as described from Bar University of Science and Technology, but I also at the same time in the University of Gießen in Germany. Thank you to the team that we work with in this. Okay, so why this region specifically? Uh, we realize that indeed the prevalence of cystosomiasis in this region is high, but a lot of data is missing on where slaves exist and so on. And why possibly MDA does not completely eliminate this disease from the community is reinfection, which can be high. And this does not target snails and also does also not target reservoir hosts. You also note that in our community we are studying, there is a high tendency of open defecation. So even treated people get reinfected after they, are, yeah, they get in contact with the same waters that have had the parasites before. So indeed, if we are to work uh, within the guidelines to eliminate cystosomiasis, uh, and incorporate snail control, we need a lot of snail data. Uh, we need to know where these snails exist and whether these snails actually are infected. To do so, well, we need a lot of support and that's why the system science approach really comes in handy here. So in our study area, we lack substantial information indeed. Even in recent studies, like from Exum and colleagues, we see that this area, which is very hard to reach, uh, also lacks data. As we have nationwide data on distribution of cystosomiasis currently, we still don't have this information here. So one of the solutions to this challenge is actually citizen scientists. Citizen scientists live in the community and they can participate in reporting within their communities. So that makes it easier uh, even when scientists cannot reach there. The overall aim is to 
increase the spatial temporal resolution of snail abundance data. Uh, this would be very important in informing targeted snail control in the future. And to achieve that, we ask whether the system scientists we are suggesting can ably identify snails and whether they can also detect and estimate the snail abundances at a particular site. This is what we are really, really going to be talking about going forward. So to do that, the network was created and the community members were first nominated by the local leadership. And this also improves ownership of the program since the local community leadership uh, participated in the selection of the citizens to participate in the first place. And then the final selection of the people that we started with was by the ATRAP team. And we started this campaign involving citizen scientists in March 2021. But every year uh, we have refresher trainings. Initially, we had the initial training to, to give the citizens the knowledge and identification of snails in sampling water chemistry, reporting human activities, everything they do, we had a, a training. But every year, we get a refresher training to improve their skills in this field. Also, citizen scientists are members of the community and they participate in solving uh, issues that come up within their communities. So, for instance, recently when we had an outbreak of coronavirus, there was a lot of lack of information. We do periodic training to, to the citizen scientists so that they get information to be able to effectively communicate or carry out other new roles that they get from time to time. Uh, we, uh, in our study area, we have identified 82 water contact sites, and these are over a, an area of 750 kilometers, square kilometers. Each citizen scientist, uh, we have a team of 25, has two to four sites which they monitor on a weekly basis, while the expert, well, myself, I monitor the same sites a man on a monthly basis. We use the same sampling procedures for the sites so that the data can be comparable. So uh, these study sites are, are different in a, in a way. They have different ecological nature. Some are at the lake, others are in wetlands, or spring wells and streams. Our initial thought was that since the cystosmiasis risk is higher at the lake we would expect maybe we shall find more snails at the lake than in these other water bodies but we also tried to find out whether these water bodies actually contain cystomyces uh, intermediate hosts but also if those snails also contain the parasites so cystosoma mansionai is the main parasite that affects the communities here and three species of bioflaria have been identified by previous studies. These include the uh, uh, Bionflaria sudanica, Bionflaria pfeifferi, and Bionflaria stanley. Bionflaria stanley is only lacustrine and is endemic to Lake Albert. And it has also been found to be really, really uh, very compatible with cystosome parasites. So we also monitor radix snail species abundancy because uh, these are very important in spreading of liver fluke infections and livestock farming or livestock production is a major source of livelihoods in our community. So uh, as indicated earlier, Tina explained this very well. So the data that is submitted by the citizen scientists via mobile application, the Cobo toolbox, uh, reaches us through a central server and in this central server, then we download the data raw into our system, our computers, and then we have developed a semi-automated validation protocol where we look at the data submitted by the citizen sciences. And here, some of the validation is uh, man by manually observing, for example, the pictures that have been sent. For example, the snails, if they find snails at a site, we ask through the form that is within the COBO tool to take a picture of that and then also give us the identity of such a snail. 
which they told us this is by Flaria, we verify the picture and confirm indeed the season scientists reported by Flaria when it is true or not. However, we have also some, some of the data they collect that is checked automatically. For instance, we have expected ranges of temperature the water can be in that study area. So if someone reported that they recorded the, the, the water temperature was zero degrees Celsius, that is unexpected and that would be flagged automatically as an error. So that means that we are not actually validating 100% that the data submitted is, is entirely 100% validated. For example, if it was 29 degrees and someone reported 30, it would be in the range, but those cases are very rare. And um, after that, we provide personalized feedback to the individuals regarding their data submission and improvements have been observed as we shall see when we provide feedback to the system scientists. So this is an example of the pictures that uh, we receive through the application. And from this, for example, on the very left, we can easily tell whether we can read off the values of this picture from the test strip that has been photographed. So the potential error here is if, for example, we cannot read properly the, the, the color changes on the strip, maybe because of a poor picture, then we consider that an error. And if we can see, uh, for instance, this is very cl a clear picture, we can read off the values and enter them manually into the form of the data they are sub submitting. So this is also part of the manual process we go through in validating the data. Uh, my colleague Noelia does this on a regular basis. So the pictures of the snails you can see from here, one can easily tell whether it's bionflaria snails, whether it's radix snails, and on the bottom right, other snails. We also ask the citizen scientists to take a picture of other snails so that we can verify whether the snails of interest, bionflaria snails, radix snails, and blinder snails, are not included among others, whether they actually effectively identified the snails. So that's part of the validation process before the data is processed. What we are seeing is that a lot of data has been generated by the different citizen scientists. So far, uh, as of September, we had 3,591 individual reports, and that's a lot of data, which is not really easy to collect if one person had to go to the field and ground truth or collect this information uh, by him or herself. So the output here we are indicating is each citizen scientist has got the total number of sites they sample, and that number of sites is fixed to that person. And we expect the citizen scientists go to these sites on a weekly basis. So we have a total number of reports expected. And then we compute how many reports they submitted uh, over this period of time. Sometimes the citizen scientists are not able to go to the field for valid reasons. And they indicate this. Uh, and this it, is very OK. We include that in our reporting here. But what we can observe here is that indeed there are individual differences where some people uh, report very regularly uh, while a few will report less than 50 percent of the times so we also ask questions what actually drives the individual differences in reporting why is it that some people report more than the rest does it uh, is it explained by the motivation of the individuals this is a, another study which is being conducted, and my colleague Marcy will talk a bit about this. Also, we ask whether really citizen scientists can correctly identify the snails. Because if they are to identify hotspots, then they need to identify snails correctly first. Then we shall rely on their data. So what we observe is that, well, indeed, their submissions sometimes are not free of error. A few errors are committed here and there, but these errors are not to say they are all snail identification errors. Some of these could be snail identification errors, which are the lowest, while we also have GPS location errors, wrong sampling time, 
since the citizen scientists and I sample for the same period of time, we have we have fixed a certain time range where we shall consider the, da the data to be correct. But for comparison purposes, we need to have similar sampling effort. Sometimes it can be a picture was taken poorly that we cannot easily identify its nails, maybe the camera moved. Um, the aqua test strip was taken in bits. We cannot read all the information. These are the errors we are talking about here. But the errors are really minimal. And we see also that when we provided feedback to the citizen scientists in the first case here, when you see the, the longer yellow arrow, this number of errors reduced significantly. And this also verify, uh, uh, justifies the need for refresher trainings, whereby also when we provide refresher trainings to the citizen scientists, the errors committed generally reduce. Currently, we can say that the data submitted is really very good quality. Uh, well, another question is, well, sometimes we have different snails that have morphological semblances. Can the citizen science tell the differences between these snails? For instance, if I provided these pictures here that you can see on your screen, do you think these pictures are of the same genus, for example? The citizen scientists are only identifying the three genera. We didn't want to provide too much information to confuse them. So, will you tell from your observation here whether these pictures are of Bionflaria, both of them, or one of them, or none of them? Okay, let's see. Well, citizen scientists are able to tell what is Bionflaria and what is not with training. Some uh, morphologically similar genera like Gerarus can be confusing to a person without much training. They may consider them as Bionflaria, but we are very happy that this is in science is ably distinguish them. And uh, we observed also that artificial intelligence, we have a, a team member who is working on developing an algorithm to see whether snails can be detected remotely by just using a mobile application. And the good thing with this application is that from a pool of snails, they can easily identify which snails belong to which group. But this is still work in progress. It is not yet fully developed. For now, we can say that the, the algorithm developed can easily tell, for example, what is true by Bionflaria from what is not by Bionflaria. But it can also not go to the species level to identify which species and still work is in progress. However, we have good prospects in this line. So the question also would be whether we can rely on their data collection. In other words, whether they can detect the same snail abundance at a site compared to an expert. This is uh, what we have also looked at, but generally we see that these are considering just detection of snail presence at a site, presence or absence, without considering their numbers. Generally, we have a high agreement of our, our collected data as experts with the citizen science collected data, 80% agreement. And um, this agreement, we also sectioned it into what we call the true positives, where we, we both find snails at a site, true negatives, where we both don't find snails at a site, and false negatives, where we where, where uh, they don't find snails at a site, but the expert finds snails at a site. But I need to mention that when they say, we say false negatives, it's not true that these snails do not exist. They actually exist in nature but one group did not find them. Either the ex expert didn't find them or the scientists didn't find them. The false positives are those where the citizen scientists found snails at a site and the expert never found. It doesn't make them inexistent snails. It's only that the two different sampling points of the people, uh, they didn't find the snails uh, at the same site. Okay, one didn't find the snails, sorry.
And we also look at the same for radix snails, the intermediate host of fasciola parasites. And we see also uh, a, a, an agreement of about 71% between the, the, the data sets. However, here we note that there is a significant number of false negatives where the expert finds snails while the citizen scientists do not find the snails. And this is mainly attributed to the habit of the linear snails or radix snails. And here we note that actually the radix snails tend to strongly attach to the substrate. So if care is not taken, one may easily miss them out when they sample and agitate this, the vegetation lightly, they leave them there and may think they are not there. This is more so when the abundance of the radix snails is small. So generally we see that the agreement in the data sets in identifying the three genera, the Linus, Bainflaria, and Radix, is good, is not random. And indeed, citizen scientists can detect snail presence at the site. Only data which has been uh, cleaned without errors was considered in the analysis. So, well, sometimes we observe differences in uh, agreement. Sometimes we have some bit of disagreement in the data sets. What would be the cause of that? When we analyze our data, we observe that uh, the site type is important in describing, in explaining the differences. For example, at the lake sites, more disagreements are more likely than in other site types. And this is possibly because the lake is really a very dynamic system uh, with a lot of wave action at the shorelines, vegetation shifts are more frequent. And then this means also the populations of snails at a particular location will be more dynamic. So going there this morning and I find snails and another person comes in the afternoon when the vegetation, for example, has been moved to another place, chances are higher that they will miss the snails because the habitat has been changed so fast. So snail abundance is also another thing whereby when the snail abundance at the site is low, we find that citizen scientists are less likely to detect the presence of snails at class sites. Well, this is good and bad in a way. Uh, good because high abundance uh, is found at sites where we can say there is higher risk of infection. So citizen scientists can easily detect areas where infection is possibly going to be highest if the snails are infected. Uh, well, about species diversity, we see that higher species diversity, also areas with such diversity had lower chances of, of agreement in the data sets than those areas where there was dominancy of a particular snail species, especially if that dominant snail species was Bionflaria, which also uh, it somehow links to the snail abundancy question. Well, we see, we try to map out the distribution of the snails in our study area. Our initial thought and hypothesis was maybe at the lake, we have more snails that transmit schistosomiasis than in the upland. Remember this uh, study area is characterized by the fact that at the lock shores, we have a lower altitude at about 600 meters above sea level, while we have a steep escarpment uh, going to up to around 1,400 meters. And we expected because of high uh, prevalence of cystosomiasis at the lake, so will be the numbers of, of, of Bionflaria snails and other snail species. But no, we find that the data from the citizen scientists maps that they are indeed the upper upland locations in streams and rivers and ponds, we have more uh, intermediate host snails than at the lake shores. This trend is consistent with the data collected by the expert, where uh, we see more snails collected in the upland than at the lake shores. However, the prevalence, the differences in prevalence of the systemasis at these different locations could be explained by the differences in human activities, I mean, human behavior, which could be uh, something else to study. So when we look at the 
abundance data generally we see the expert reports higher abundance than of the system scientists. So here they compare that the the abundance of bankflood is highest followed by radix and four uh, followed by by, by blindness snails. This same trend is recorded by the experts and the system scientists, which tells us that indeed the two are reporting the same uh, kind of data. We see finally we can for now conclude that system scientists can correctly identify snail genera after appropriate training and they reliably detect snails snail presence at the putative stomacy transmission site uh the season sciences therefore can increase partial temporal resolution of snail distribution data compared to a single expert in this case one phd student uh however we see that uh, snail abundance data differs between season science and experts but we only have one expert to compare with, so we can't say that we have a good sample size of experts. So there's a lot of questions we can still answer in this. And we are also still analyzing it further to try and find out other uh, patterns and why there's the differences. Finally, I look at what we are working on. We are working on more data analysis. Uh, to so like to come up with a complete picture of our data at the end of the project and also looking at the links between the distribution patterns and the abiotic uh, factors and biotic factors influencing snail distribution. Citizen scientist data is it will be used to map putative transmission sites which could be useful in guiding uh, control in the future while expert data can be used to map actual transmission sites. The expert also does additional work of doing of uh, examining the presence of parasites in the snails doing using diagnostic PCR tools. So can map actual transmission sites. And we look at with finger cro fingers crossed uh, the possibility of integrating uh, artificial intelligence in validation of data remotely. Otherwise, uh, a big thank you to the team of our citizen scientists we work with and for everyone for listening to me. Thank you. Wow, Julius and team. <laughs> thank you very much for this presentation. I, I don't think I've quite seen that many questions in any single iCentury Connect as this one. Uh, this has been a really, really exciting couple of presentations and project. Thank you for sharing that with us. It was really interesting to hear not just about um, uh, where it's going well and the benefits of adapting citizen science to tackling schistosomiasis, but also it's really interesting how you've made put a lot of effort into outlining the gaps and it's all about new partnerships and it'd be really interesting and exciting to see new partners perhaps completely out of the sphere of NTDs uh, entering to fill those gaps whether they be from the digital sector or as you mentioned right towards the end the kind of artificial intelligence maybe even the gaming industry looking at crowdsourcing um, all sorts of avenues to to look forward to um, you've had a lot of compliments here from uh, many of our attendees. Uh, Dan Coley here summed it up really nicely. Hi, Dan, by the way. I need to leave, but enjoyed both presentations very much. This is an ex excellent example of forward thinking research, well designed and pursued. If this approach truly leads to effective focal snail control, it could be a critical addition to the attack on schistosomiasis. Thank you very much, Dan Coley. So those are the words from someone who's been in this field for decades, so the future of schistosomiasis control, no less than that here today at ICNTD Connect. So thank you very much for sharing that. Before we start to tackle the um, questions, I'll hand over to our last presenter of the day, uh, Mercy, we'll hand over to you. And great, we have an excellent connection. So that's really wonderful. Thank you again, Julius. <laughs> 
Okay, um, can you hear me, Marianne? Yes, very clearly. Perfect, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Julia Santina, uh, for the presentation and for shedding light on the potential of citizen science to boost um, scientific efforts and to complement experts um, in all these scientific endeavors. But we still have one question hanging. Um, how do you retain, how do you recruit citizen scientists and retain them active over such a long period of time? Uh, this uh, part of the answer uh, for this question lies in understanding the factors that drive citizen science participants into action. And this is what I'm going to be taking you through um, the, in the rest of the afternoon. Yes. Okay, uh, we've already heard from Tina that um, there is clear concentration of citizen science initiatives in the Global North and very scarce activities going on in the Global South, particularly um, Africa. This is both good news and bad news. Good news in the sense that um, these citizen science initiatives in the Global North um, provide opportunities for practices in the Global South to learn from. But then bad news because we cannot simply copy paste best practices from the Global North to the Global South because we have to recognize and realize that there is different um, local dynamics at play, for example, culture, the cultural differences. So we cannot simply translate what is happening in the Global North to the Global South. And for this, re uh, for this reason, um, the ATRAP Citizen Science Network was contextualized and adapted to fit into um, local, uh, local operating standards. For example, the selection procedure uh, where the, uh, the team of ATRAP worked with local leaders really to identify and select um, participants, but also the participants had a rigorous intensive training just before they commenced data collection. Um, they also provided with materials and equipment um, to facilitate them to collect their data. Uh, a, a very good um, material, I think, which is most loved by everyone, are the smartphones that the participants receive to facilitate um, them collecting and sending data to the experts. Uh, another key um, uh, item that was contextualized was the financial compensation. And make no mistake, this is not payment, it's not salary, uh, but um, the participants are compensated for the costs they incur while they go to the field to collect data, for example, transportation, and also money to buy an internet connection to be able to send the data to the experts. Another item that was contextualized is the mode of operation. With ATRAP, it is fixed that the participants have to collect data every week, and so this is a bit different from normal um, citizen science practices, which are very, very, very voluntary in nature. And we have done all that, uh, but then uh, the key question here still remains, participants are the pillar, but why, why would they continue? Why would they participate in the project? Uh, I mean, they could, after getting the smartphone, the training, still say, no, I'm not going to offer my time, my energy to collect data. They could still say, I do not want to do this. But so it's very, very important for every citizen science initiative to understand what factors are driving their participants into, into action. And, and, and what we have realized is the factors are driving people into action. Initial factors could change. They could evolve and change during, during the project. So there could be factors for continuing to be in the project, but also a future participation, not only of this particular project, but of other projects um, could have different reasons uh, as why people um, decide to participate in the future. And in ideal situations, there, there is um, a, a situation where participants themselves independently start citizen science movements or initiatives. Apart from looking at the factors that drive them, that enable them, we also have to look at factors that could stop them, barriers, things that could hinder them from actively participating in these citizen science initiatives. And this is what we are doing, and this is what part of my study, I'm a PhD student on the ATRAP project, and uh, one of my questions is to find out what are the enabling factors, what is enabling these participants to, to, to participate actively, what is driving them into action, but also a look at what is limiting them, what are the barriers, what would stop them from actively participating in the ATRAP project. 
And to do this, we base ourselves so much on examples from the global north because there is so scarce information literature from the global south on motivation, which is why we identified two theories um, to understand motivation of the participants, one of which is the volunteer functions inventory, which provides six reasons uh, as to why people would volunteer. And among these six reasons, there is value, it's a concern for others. There is social, a desire to develop new or even strengthen existing relationships. And then there is career where someone is influenced by a desire to enhance, to advance their career prospects. We also have enhancement, which is really a personal development or developing self-esteem. And some people could volunteer because they, they want to protect or they want to escape negative feelings, which relates to protective. And lastly, understanding, which um, relates to a desire to develop, uh, to gain new skills, to gain new, new knowledge and experiences. On the other hand, we also have the theory of planned behavior, which, which helps us to predict the behavior of the participants. If at all, they will perform the tasks assigned to them. And we have attitudes, which uh, looks at um, how they think about the tasks um, that have been assigned to them. We also have control, how difficult or easy is it for the participants to actually perform these tasks and how committed are they to perform these tasks uh, in relation to intention. We also have moral obligation. There are personal responsibilities and norms. What are these? A self-identity. Do they, uh, what image, what self-image do they have of themselves? And also social norms, lastly, which relates to social uh, pressure from significant people around them. We try to look at all these factors and how um, the participants um, relate to these factors. But also we look at their personal um, attributes like age and employment status, education level. How do these um, factors interact and, and uh, drive them into action? Uh, not forgetting there are also project level factors uh, which could influence um, participation, but that will be for another time. Uh, what have we uh, found out? Um, our participants, uh, the participant profile is that we have more males um, participating, majority are males who are middle aged. Um, but we also have uh, quite a number of majority of them have middle level education. And by middle level, we refer to secondary school level. Uh, we also realize that most of the individuals are self-employed. Uh, this differs so much from citizen science initiatives in the Global North, uh, particularly where we have um, more older males, highly educated and retired individuals participating. When it comes to reasons for participating, what we notice is that participants have actually high motivation. There are several factors influencing. We don't have one single factor influencing them to to participate, they are here to understand, to gain new knowledge, they are here to enhance their careers, they are here to, to um, because they have values that they are concerned about their communities. But what is very striking about um, their motives is that, and this is very contrary to volunteering literature from the Global South, which indicates that social is a high driving factor for volunteers or for people who offer time and, uh, and free time and services uh, for for actions like a trap but what we see here is that the social factor um, is not as important as we had anticipated it still relates to the behavior factors realize that social pressure does not really influence their behavior so there there, there, there is no uh, social elements uh, coming up like we had anticipated but what is also clear from the behavioral factors is that um, the participants the participants indicated have a low control over whether they can participate or not. Um, and this relates really to the fact that a, a trap has a fixed mode of operation, which requires them to go to the field every week. And so they cannot um, simply decide when and, and, and what time to go to the field. Uh, the mode of operation is clearly outlined at the very beginning. When we relate uh, motives to their personal characteristics, we see um, that there is, um, of course, differences, but what is very significant between the males and the females, for example, is that the females uh, find social and career-related factors more important than the males. Uh, and this, this is, uh, I relate with this, uh, females want to expand their social network and also build their careers. This is a good opportunity that ATRAP is providing. Um, when you look at edge, what we notice is that the younger participants, and by younger we mean everyone 39 and below, 
um, had a high score for, um, for, uh, for, for most of the, actually all of the factors. But what is significant is the career and social uh, factors where the, the younger participants found career related factors more important, significantly more important for them. And this is consistent with literature from the global north um, that younger volunteers actually are there for advancing and enhancing their career and, and future prospects. Uh, when we run to education level, um, there is no evident significant differences in, in the motives uh, within different education levels. But what is clear here, the trend is that higher, highly educated participants, and by highly educated is anything higher institution of education, um, uh, rated um, factors to do with personal development, like understanding, enhancement, career, more highly than the other factors. Uh, we also try to relate motives to output, and, and Julius mentioned a bit about output in terms of number of reports uh, that the participants uh, forward. Uh, what we see is uh, what is what we see, and what is very surprising is that highly motivated participants actually have a low output, and this is um, something that that is very surprising to us. Uh, and more information is yet to come on this. So what we see here in general is that high motivation does not immediately equates to a high output or a high performance for, for that matter. Uh, if, we, we want, if we want to try to explain why this is so, uh, I quickly looked at um, individual, individual performance. And, and at first glance, the, what the trend that comes out is that participants from the same location actually had similar kind of output or similar kind of performance, if you would like. So this is really, at first glance, uh, no analysis yet, but yes, for more analysis, watch the space, more is coming. Uh, but this is what we have so far. Uh, when we run to limiting factors, as I conclude, uh, what is very clear from the participants is bad weather is a huge barrier to them. Uh, when, the, when the weather is bad, they cannot go to the fields to collect data, and this relates to transport systems. Uh, when the weather is bad, uh, it impedes transportation. Uh, but also death uh, of a relative impedes or, or stops them from going to the, to the field. And this was clearly evident during the recently concluded Awareness Week, where we had to shift some programs because a community member had died and so most people had to go and attend the funeral. What we also see is that lack of transport and sickness is a huge barrier, particularly uh, for the females in, in their trap network. And um, what we are going to do next is we are going to continue data analysis. This is, this is just baseline um, results or data, if we might call it that way. But we still have to probe for why participants are continuing to participate in the ATRAP project, as you had earlier from Tina. ATRAP started in 2019, but the participants started collecting in 2020. So we need to find out why are they continuing to participate in the project until right now. And of course, we'll now dig deeper into output, how, why is it relating to motivation this way and, and, and the trends that are going on. That, that is what we'll be doing next and watch out uh, for our results to come in soon. Um, do not forget from today, if you forget anything, do not forget that citizen science needs to be contextualized and adapted to fit a particular local situation. Two, don't forget that there is not one factor that is driving participants into participation. There is so many multiple factors that are influencing them into action. Three, don't forget that personal development um, um, factors like understanding, learning, new knowledge are key drivers, while this, a desire to develop even to strengthen um, their relationships is not as important as we had anticipated it to be. Uh, also, what is important here today is that different demographic profiles evoke different motives. Um, so uh, manage citizen science, um, Project leaders need to watch out for this. And lastly, high motivation does not necessarily equate to high output. This is uh, from our very first findings. Uh, I should continue saying this. And we've been looking at motivation up to this point from the lens of, um, of theories. Would like now to really hear it from the horse's mouth, if, if I can use this phrase. Uh, we are privileged this afternoon to be joined by Chrysostom, who is a citizen scientist. 
And I would like to hear it from him. Why is he in Atrap? Why did he agree to join Atrap? Why is he continuing to be part of the Atrap team? Thank you so much. Over to you, Chris Aston. I decided to join the team in the struggle of fighting stomiasis, uh, simply because first and more, foremost, I'm a citizen, so I need to serve my area. And uh, next, as a person, I need also to be a scientist. Then, also being a native of, a na of the area, and having been selected, I must show trust in my people and serve them. Then, another thing, uh, personally, I, I would like, I, I wanted to acquire skills, knowledge, and experience in solving existing problem of systemiasis. Then, also, I want to explore more about the problem existing within. Then also, I wish also to participate and find out ways of controlling Bilhazia through different ways and measures that I would acquire through trainings. Then lastly, I participated so that I can also get skills on how I can have life experience in of handling risky water practices which is within my area of jurisdiction. Thank you. Then uh, the next question I wish to continue participating because as per now I have acquired more skills and knowledge on how I can handle the problem, sampling, I'm becoming an expert, and uh, I feel I'm also a scientist. Then I also feel privileged to have also participated in this dialogue talk, show, show out how I feel and how I can continue, because I find the sampling has become part of my hobby. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Chris Aston. And, and that um, brings us to the end of my talk. Uh, we've had it from the theoretical perspective, but we've also had it from the citizen scientist himself. And there is so many of these testimonies um, that we have. I think we shall be uploading them on our website. Uh, we have a website where you can find all information about ATRAP and other citizen science initiatives in Uganda. Thank you so much. Um, over to you, Marianne. Thank you very much. I can only echo the words of all the attendees. I think I can't phrase it much better than uh, Farina Lindeki here. Hi, Farina, who says, I'm amazed by the wonderful work done by everyone on this project. Well done and congratulations. Totally agree with that. Thank you, Cruzestom. Thank you, Mercy, for your last two interventions. And what's been really interesting is hearing all these insights into what motivates people, and particularly now with the advent of COVID, uh, this kind of voracious appetite to know more about what is happening, but also the kind of constant feed and stream of health news and uh, news on infectious diseases and diseases in general, I think it'll be a really interesting time to see how everyone's uh, approaches and motivations to interact with infectious diseases evolves. So thank you. You've given us so much to think about. Tina, Mercy, Julius, Cruz, Tom, uh, a massive thank you. Uh, we do have many, many questions. Um, uh, Rachel Gerland here again saying thank you, very inspiring work. Thank you, Rachel, for joining us. Uh, Josephine Adijobi saying well done. Stephen Bremer, thank you to all the presenters for a good session. So I think it's unanimous. Uh, you have uh, blown us away. Uh, but so now turning a little bit to some questions that everyone uh, has been posting. And thank you for an amazing audience who's been really engaged today. I think... Um, 
Firstly, I'd just like to read out a comment here by John Bosco, uh, Bonigaba. John Bosco is saying, many thanks for the great presentation. In Rwanda, we have uh, schistosomiasis elimination by 2024 as target, and the elimination strategy under development includes the same approach, where local leaders and community health workers will serve as community citizen scientists, to lead to required change to reverse the situation in the community. So definitely an approach being shared and rolled out in other areas, but I think quite a few of those tuning in today are have been really interested and are asking very concrete questions, perhaps really looking to find out in a more practical sense, how do you roll out such a partnership and an intervention? So we have here a question, our first question from Wangari Wambui saying, Great presentation and work that ATRAP is doing. My question is, how were the citizen scientists selected among the community members? Nadine, uh, sorry, it's very small font. Nadine Rujani says, hello Nadine. What is the minimum qualification of citizen scientists or any other criteria used to select them? Rosalie Tuan's asking, were the students of local schools involved in the project? And David Rollinson asking how much time is a citizen scientist expected to spend on the project? So quite a few questions about the practical mechanics of building this um, body of citizen scientists. I don't know if um, who would like to go first in answering some of those or all of those. Julius? Mm -hmm. I, is my connection or something? Yeah, we're good. We can hear you. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the questions. And um, well, we had a selection criterion. Oh, selection criteria, it wasn't one, but there were many. Where we, first of all, thought about these people as uh members of the community who will uh identify with the community problems so one of the things we considered is that they should be willing to volunteer because it was put out clearly from the start that this is voluntary and the individuals with volunteering experience all those who are interested in doing voluntary work were given priority first of all so from the beginning when we told this this is voluntary work and also the community leadership had had people they had worked with before in other interventions like malaria control and other, even even in systematic control by distributing uh, price quantity. So this was one of the criteria used in selection the individuals. But we also had others that these people should be able to read and write. We didn't have minimum qualifications like you should have obtained this level of education. But if we, if we could verify that indeed they can read and write because the application is in English language and they can interpret it, well and good, we didn't want to ask too much of them. So the minimum qualification was not there. We have people who have set it up to the sixth level primary school and those who have a bachelor's degree or even beyond that. So we have a diverse community as long as they can participate. So, and they had to be trustworthy members of the community and because we trust them with equipment, we trust with them with the knowledge and all this. So the community selected people they trust. That's one of them. Fantastic. Uh, Mercy, Tina, would you like to add anything? No, we also tried to look at the gender balance, which was uh, important to us. Um, this was not always easy um, to find enough female participants. Uh, as you saw by Mercy, uh, it's dominated by males. And in Congo, it turned out to be even more difficult because smartphone um, um, possession is actually um, not always allowed or it's not easy. Uh, so there in Congo, we work with couples where the man is also involved if we have selected a female. So um, because it's important to have input from both genders. So we really paid attention to that. And did you find that your citizen scientists then themselves kind of became ambassadors for this cause or perhaps a um, 
trusted source of information. Um, it always strikes me in the playground. People tend to ask me all sorts of immunization questions. I'm not a virologist, but um, it's kind of building that trust rapport. And so did, did you find that? Definitely, and I think uh, Cruises Tom can testify here, uh, or Mercy, if you want to add. But uh, Cruises, no, I, I, yes, I could just add before maybe Cruises Tom. We we find this happening among the citizen scientists. Uh, we have um, testimonies of people saying that uh, now in the community, whenever people see me with a scoop net, they're asking me about uh, water, and some people have been baptized names such as uh, Doctor of Water because they're always um, at the water contact sites uh, trying to collect snail samples. So yes, indeed, there is this pattern going on. It's so good to, to like, and this is what I feel really that um, even during COVID, uh, we had a curfew in Uganda and participants um, testified that um, they, they could pass the curfew time just because they were from collecting samples from their sites. So yes, that is what is developing down here. <laughs> That's great to know, and um, <clears throat> because I think we're reaching the end of our uh, advertised time, some colleagues had, ha are thinking about maybe having to move on. But just to remind everyone that the the session is recorded, so you know all your questions will be answered in the next few minutes. But just to say before you go, Poppy, goodbye and thank you for joining us. That's Poppy Lamberton uh, from the University of Glasgow. I have to go, but so inspiring and great presentations, exciting new approaches ahead. Thanks for leading the way. Now, I am not saying that we should all go now because I'm really hooked and I want to hear more, uh, as I'm sure many of those uh, connected also. So if that's okay with you, if you have a few more minutes, we'd love for you to answer some more questions, if you don't mind. Good, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, moving perhaps from the humans to the snails now. There were a few slightly more technical questions. So uh, Rosalie Tuan and uh, Fadila Tufule Bakari were asking about the species. So do you have just one Biomphalaria host species in Uganda? Now the answer is no. We actually have three uh, species in our study area. That is the uh, Biomphalaria sudanica, Biomphalaria pfeifferi, uh, which is the most common, and then Biomphalaria stanley, which is only restricted to Lake Albert. So when I talk about Biomphalaria species, all of the three actually are transmitters of Cisosoma mansonai. So we didn't want to distinguish because they are all equally important. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, and a question here from David uh, Rollinson from the GSA and the NHM. Uh, what happens to the snails after collection? And Rosalie Tuan also asking, uh, are the samples of the snails collected after, so after collection, are they perhaps sent to a lab to be identified by morphology? Okay. I could answer that as well. Well, uh, there are two scenarios. We have two groups of people collecting data here. The citizen scientists and then the expert. The citizen scientists are so regular in the field that they, if they collected the snails and extracted them from the site every week, they would dismiss the population, perhaps. Yeah, or they would significantly affect the natural dynamics in the populations. And uh, one of, the, of our interests is to actually see whether they can observe patterns in population dynamics in the area. So for the system scientists, they return the snails to the site after, well, it has some ethical consideration and questions we have to think about here, because has, if they are dangerous, why are we putting them back? That's a major question we have to ask. But uh, to really study the dynamics in populations, we wouldn't really remove the snails from the site. But the expert on a monthly basis picks these snails and takes them to the lab. First, to shed them if they produce parasites using the shedding techniques. That also we record that. But also, even if they didn't shed, we preserve samples in ethanol and take them to the lab for genetics, uh, also for RDPCRs to see if they actually contain parasites. Maybe they were prepatent, and also for uh, se sequencing Afro and other um, molecular studies. So we do both. We return them and also we pick them. 
but we chose who should pick um, depending on when, who can influence population so much. Fantastic. Uh, Mercy, Tina, would you like to add anything at all? So just kind of broadening the lens a bit and uh, thinking about all the learnings that you've had. We had a question here from uh, Cameron Rafiq, my colleague and co-director here at iCentD. What were some of the knowledge gaps that you found within the community? I suppose um, part of the aim of really building a, a trusted relationship with citizen scientists in the community is to perhaps uncover uh, some new insights into what might encourage just to surmise this to persist. Yes, maybe I will answer that. Um... But this study has been done by Maxon, as I mentioned in my presentation. Uh, but soon this paper will uh, appear in post neglected tropical diseases. So what was very apparent was that actually the knowledge on Bilharzia was really high on the symptoms. More than 90% knew all the sy symptoms and so on. The knowledge was a bit less on diagnosis, how the disease is um, correctly diagnosed, that you really need to detect the X in the stool. And you can only do that at specific um, places. Um, but it was especially some uh, practices that like going to the lake and fetching the water and fishing that are still uh, persisting. Um, and also what we found out were these taboos or um, the belief that women were responsible of the disease and this could lead to um, divorce or something that um, that the lake water is safe, that some people still think that, um, or that guessing in the water will lead to transmission. And so um, we also found out that even when there were um, latrines, people still prefer the lake for uh, open defecation because they think this will really increase the um, chance for catching bigger fish. So um, these uh, beliefs are still there. Also, they think the lake water tastes better. Um, so it's really a mix. But I, I think that's why we, during the awareness campaigns, really focused on those myths and the taboos. Also, to really um, try to involve the community if there is somebody infected, um, to talk about this, to help the person, to guide them to the village handle teams or to the local clinic, um, and so on. Thank you. Very, uh, that's really interesting, actually, and it ties in with an earlier question from Birger Lundgren, uh, who was asking, is, is poor sanitation the main reason of the problem in the areas where you've worked? Yeah, so it is true that especially around uh, the lake, um, there is a lack of latrines. And so we do transfer that, uh, that information to a local um, um, policy makers or village leaders. Um, so it is true, it's, it's very unstable around the lake. It has recently been flooded. So it's difficult to, to really um, build these latrines. Um, but then on the other hand, there, there's also a behavioral aspect that still even in some areas where we see there are latrines that they're not used, that, that they still prefer to use the lake. So we have to tackle both. Um, work on the availability of latrines, so build more latrines, but also change the behavior so that they will really use the latrines um, as well. That's fascinating. And John Bosco Monigaba in the chat replying to another participant, Stephen, but John writes, I totally agree with you that a point Stephen made, um, which is to have the citizens involved, but also feed as well input from experts this is what we saw in our outreach where we met communities and we did snail collection to show them and explain how snails contribute to schisto transmission and its severe morbidity many community members requested video and more info related to schisto to help them educate their neighbors um, now we're not trying to give you even more work than you've already got on your plate but are you looking at broader partnerships in terms of science communication, in terms of science outreach to really build on what you've achieved so far and those very strong partnerships with the community. Also, 
I think it was Stephen Bremer earlier on in the chat also was asking whether um, there's maybe partnerships with local schools um, to have uh, workshops or an education kind of stream through their schooling to reinforce your work. Yes, yeah, so we did invite at our kickoff meeting various stakeholders and now um, a month ago during our midterm meeting, uh, we also invited them. And so there's um, um, some, some uh, clear partners that we identified, like uh, people from Raising the Village, from Join for Water, that are really focusing on wash strategies, so hygiene, um, safe water and sanitation. Um, but what we found there is that they did not include yet a focus on, on Bilharza and Shisomaisis. So we uh, propose to um, use our contextualized uh, educational tools, the flyer, the posters, when they um, are doing new campaigns, they're moving up uh, to the lake. They're also active at other sites. And, and we also learn from them, from what they, they learned during their um, outreach activities. And so this has been really instrumental and we really want to intensify uh, these collaboration with these uh, local NGOs because they have really their feet on the ground and a lot of um, experience. I don't know whether uh, Julius or um, Mercy would like to add on this. No, no, really, but maybe just to quickly say that um, from our previous or recently concluded stakeholder meeting, um, we also had people from the ministry, so at national level, um, attending. And it's it's very important to have um, this um, joint effort with not only at TRAP, but also at national level, that they take up um, some of this information about integrating Bilhazia and WASH practices and it was very good because the person was from the Ministry of Water and Environment. So yes, um, we are anticipating to have partnerships to um, take um, this work further. Fantastic. <laughs> and uh, have you had maybe from the citizen scientists themselves, so perhaps a question for Chris Storm, but have you had requests for a specific resources or any additional support something that perhaps the, your team and your partners have directly fed back to you maybe things we're not thinking about well, I, I can quickly re uh, rephrase for him if i understood properly yeah of course Whether, yeah if uh, your community members are requesting for particular support in this line. Have you heard about that, you as a citizen scientist? Okay, during our home visit, we, f we found some challenging questions like uh, provision of safe water so that they can uh, alternatively use it rather than using uh, this spring water and whatever. So it was the most challenging questions and during stakeholders meeting, uh, it was a request and uh, the local leaders agreed to put in a budget so that uh, water is put as a first priority. Fantastic. And as a citizen scientist, is there anything particular that would be help more helpful? I, I can only suggest different phones or I, I don't know what what kind of practical tools do you feel as a citizen scientist would facilitate your participation or even perhaps the participation of your peers who could engage as more? As a citizen researcher, personally, uh, together with my colleagues, we are struggling in order to put in some more information informing the community so that we can mobilize ourselves as community and put what we can so that as we wait for the budget to give also ourselves support in at least protecting this water from getting contact and using some, at least securing some funds to buy some guards to the families. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Tina, Julius, Mercy, would there be anything that you'd like to add, perhaps things that you've seen from your experience? What I also um, found out is indeed that many people um, ask for more drugs. Uh, many people also uh, complained actually about side effects of the drugs. So they said that they were not warned that they need to take some food. Um, these things popped up. But indeed, um, the lack of water always came back and um, the lack of latrines. That is what I remember from the last um, field visit. And Final question uh, for Christian for Manu Gouvras. Do you find that you now talk more about Bilhazia with friends and family? Is that something that you've noticed as well in your peer group? That you now talk more about Bilhazia with your friends and family than before? Uh, before, Bilhazia was not talked of because they were, in fact, even if they were prayer, distribution of Plasquanto, but uh, they, are, they were just giving them annually, but without sensitization. So since the time this project came in, people have been informed because giving drugs minus information, some many people are not here willingly taking these drugs, but after sensitization, People are willing, even they are demanding for drugs. So since they have seen the problem is within, and uh, the, the 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 misconceptions have been removed from the community that it is witchcraft or whatever, they have taken the disease as a serious. And uh, even those who are victims gave testimonies on how they were called, how they were treated, and people are picking up. So it, after series of uh, sensitization meetings, uh, even these communication models that through drama and whatever, uh, people have actually got the information and they are going to do the needful. And finally, as citizen scientists within our communities, we are struggling to have a high rattling coverage and proper use so that sanitation is put into consideration. That's fantastic. And thank you for sharing those experiences and perhaps to bring all the things we've talked about uh, in this session kind of uh, into a final message. Uh, we'd like to ask the four of you before kind of wrapping up the session. So what are your next steps or <clears throat> beyond that, what are some of the partnerships you'd be really eager to develop at this point? And not perhaps just within ATRA, but um, uh, Tina, Mercy, you're also representing a museum. So what is, you know, the role of the museums in this, in terms of bridging that gap between the science and the citizen? Uh, what would you like to see more of turning to the future? Well, uh, of course, I hope um, this uh, project inspires uh, other institutes um, or other research groups in um, really um, tapping into uh, all this local knowledge and experience in uh, these interventions because there's a, a great knowledge out there and I see a lot of opportunity to really um, increase the community engagement and i think indeed museums um they have already their expertise in science communication and outreach uh, which comes in um, handy here because as scientists um it's really a bit like um it's a different audience to which you will need to um communicate so you have to adapt a bit in your communication um, skills and museums can help in that so can they can share their knowledge um and that of course they have huge collections of many specimens and and we can use it also uh, for training 
apps uh, on AI to, for automatic image recognition. Of course, this is something else, but these huge collections are there, so we should valorize them. Um, so that's my uh, take from it, uh, Mercy. Uh, yes, for me, my take from it is uh, I want to really follow and, and, and find out how citizen science, the approach evolves in Uganda. It's very interesting that there are very good examples of citizen science in the global north, but would like to find out what works and doesn't work in, in Uganda or in the global south at large. So this, this is, I think, next steps for me to find out a citizen science or to come up with a citizen science framework um, for Uganda or for the global south. It's a very uh, good approach as we have had. It has great potential, but how will it apply? How will it evolve um, in settings like Uganda? I think um, that's uh, where I'm going to focus most of my energies. Yeah, Julius, over to you. Well, thank you, Tim. Uh, for now, we are trying to really understand and uh, further analyze the data from citizen scientists and myself uh, to come up with really concrete evidence of where disparities are coming from and so on. So going forward, we really think at the end we shall have a harmonious, uh, a harmonized report that indicates how we complement each other, uh, that is the experts and citizen scientists. But I also look forward to seeing more community members more confident with the life cycle of cystosoma uh, mastoni, sorry, and uh, being able to identify the snails, for example. Many people actually never thought that snails are important in spreading cystosoma So if this information can reach out to many, this would be a very good outcome and to be a multiplier if from the citizen science approach. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. And Carlos Texera here um, writes, citizens, sorry, science citizens is a type of organization that has a key role with wider aims, improving communities' life in general, taking in their hands the initiative to be safe and wealthier. Um, and that's absolutely right. And we've learned so much um, in this session, uh, honestly, we truly believe that you are trailblazers, not just in this field for schistosomiasis, but as we heard right at the beginning, there's very little citizen science in the global south. So with huge lessons and uh, forging the path, hopefully for this movement across many diseases and across many regions, we're starting to see it. Uh, Tina, as you mentioned, in context of mosquito-borne diseases, particularly in dengue, uh, lots of crowdsourcing and apps look, looking at that, but it'd be really interesting to see how this is uh, shared and the uptake across many of the other non kind of um, uh, mosquito based neglected tropical diseases. So we can't say that thank you enough to the four of you. Uh, Cruz Storm, Julius, Mercy, Tina, a massive thank you for your time today. It was lovely to meet you. Um, I think. Someone like David Rawlinson again writing brilliant thank you for all of us who have collected snails and been involved with schister control, uh, some for decades, as we heard from Dan. There are some excellent and inspiring new approaches here for all of us. Um, also, a special shout out to Maxon and Yolito. I think, Tina, you mentioned Maxon's work soon to be published, so we'll keep an eye out for that. Um, Maxon writes wonderful presentation. Bravo to you all, but bravo to you as well, Max, on part of ATRAP in Uganda. And again, a really huge thank you to everyone who has been involved today. Uh, Francis Olaki, you write, this has been great work done by these colleagues. We look forward in sharing more scientific information on your works on schistosomiasis. That's absolutely right. We look forward to hearing more from you. Uh, very soon, here at ICENTV Connect, we'll look out for your published work. Uh, but in the meantime, a big thank you. Thank you to the GSA as well, Anouk, uh, who's been posting lots of links. And uh, please don't forget, this session is recorded. So anything you'd like to go over and see again, uh, that will be available on our YouTube channel very shortly. 
Um, and also, if anyone could possibly uh, answer Fadila Tubakari's question, I will start my biomphalaria samples next Saturday. Can I have some advice? <laughs> So if anyone has a few minutes, uh, Fadila, to put their email address in the chat. Uh, any few words of advice, I'm sure would be he would be he would be very grateful for. So, on that note, I wish you all the best. Keep healthy, and I hope uh, we meet again very soon, albeit online. Thank you very much for the great moderation. Thank you. It's been yeah. our pleasure. Take bye care, bye, everybody. All the best. Bye. Thank you.